Cool. Well, um, then we're at start. Um, just a brief remark. Uh, my name is Johan Gardebo. Um, I'm one of the researchers here, and I'll be moderating the conversation. Um, for those of you who wish to um, present yourself, you can use the, the chat and leave a comment there and address it to both panelists and attendees, and then we can see where you're writing from and who you are. If you want to ask a question to uh, Sabine, Dolly, Stefan, and Mark, um, then leave your question in the Q&A function at the bottom um, corner of your Zoom window. And without further ado, I think we're ready to go. Uh, Sabine, the force is yours. Thank you, Johan, and uh, good afternoon. Welcome back, everyone, or welcome everyone who hasn't joined the previous sessions to this session, which is about journals and the remaking of scholarly fields as part of the Streams Transformative Environmental Humanities Conference 2020, the three-day online event hosted at the Division of History of Science, Technology and Environment at KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm in lovely Sweden. My name is Sabine Höhler. I am an STS scholar and a historian of science and technology turned environmental historian, I would say, here at the division. It is my pleasure to host this afternoon's discussion. And as Johan said, you're welcome to submit questions through the Zoom chat function or the question function so that we can tend to them in the Q&A section. We have one hour to us and if there happen to be many questions, we might be able to be a bit flexible towards the end since this is the last item on today's agenda. Um, and now I, of course, would like to uh, very much welcome our three panelists who all edit journals in the field of environmental humanities and environmental history. And first, uh, I welcome Dolly Jørgensen uh, from the University of Stavanger in Norway. Dolly edits the journal Environmental Humanities, which is a fairly new journal still, three years old. It is online and open access and published by Duke University Press. Dolly is a historian and an environmental historian, and she engages with the relations of humans with other species and with technologies which shape and also create what counts as natural. Then I welcome very much also Mark Hersey and Stephen Brain. They are the editors of Environmental History. This is the flagship, I would say, flagship environmental history journal in the world of the ESEH, uh, no, of the ASEH, the American Society for Environmental History and the Forest History Society, and is published by Oxford University Press. Both Mark and Stefan hold history positions at Mississippi State University in the US and both are environmental historians involved with, among other things, the environmental history of agriculture, of forestry, and of conservation. I'm really happy that you're all here, agree to participate in this conversation, which I think has the potential to be really exciting since environmental humanities is perceived as one of the, the hot fields in progress now. Uh, environmental history, some may remember, also had that role just a, a few years or decades ago. So then and now, these two EH journals, Environmental History, Environmental Humanities, they entered the scene and unsettled seemingly self-evident assumptions in their respective academic fields. So I think they also, these two journals share a lot, if you, if you like, but they're also very different. And we are here to find out in which way. Both journals have a history of deviating from their disciplinary mainstreams. This is a metaphor that fits our conference theme of streams. So this renewal or re replenishing or, re or diverging from the mainstream to renew and reinvent the humanities community and give visibility to new approaches and to new themes. Both fields have clashed with powerful disciplinary structures in place. Now, obviously, I have a bunch of questions that I could ask, um, but we don't have time for all of them. This must be an ongoing discussion. 
So let me just start with the most obvious question uh, to you all um, on the remaking of scholarly fields. How do environmental humanities and environmental history compare in terms of their revolutionary thrust? Like what was new and what was special in environmental history? What is new and special in environmental humanities today that might be different? And how do your journals try to express or even forward these respective features and the disciplinary challenges? Perhaps you want to start, Dolly, with the environmental humanities journal. Sure, sure. I can start um, talking about environmental humanities. Um, so as a journal, um, we're actually nine years old. Uh, so it's not as recent as one might think. Uh, so we're coming up on our, our decade. Um, and what's, what was revolutionary about it when it started was to really uh, try to bring together people who were doing different kinds of disciplines and, and see where you could speak together. So there's kind of some different ideas of what environmental humanities is. Is it a discipline? Is it an umbrella? Is it a, a, a new thing? Um, and depending who you talk to, you may get different answers. Um, but I tend to think of it as a meeting point um, in which these different disciplines come together and have shared conversations uh, about things that you could you know, transport uh, between disciplines. And so within environmental humanities, then there are people who would situate themselves um, as being historians, like myself, um, as doing eco-criticism. So people who are in both literature and film. Uh, philosophers uh, have been, if you will, they started the journal. They were philosophers um who, who were the original um kind of home um anthropologists um geographers so my co-editor is a is a geographer um franklin jen so it, it environmental humanities then is a way of of trying to find what's in common or what's transportable between those disciplines so in that way it's revolutionary um but not so revolutionary if we actually think about the way that things like um, studies, so the area studies that got set up, um, that grew up in the, in the 1970s, uh, from gender studies, African studies, Latin American studies, they also do exactly the same thing, which is to reach across what were our traditional degrees and try and have a conversation together. And it's really the same thing in environmental humanities. Well, thanks, Dolly. That's interesting that you, that you are saying, uh, in a way, it's revolutionary that, that different fields come together and talk about what they, what they share and what they have in common and what they can, in a way, forward or transport. Uh, that says a lot about, of course, the disciplinary structures that, that we still live in and with. Um, uh, Mark and Stefan, how, how would you describe uh, your journey with environmental history as a new journal um, that, that perhaps tried to meet similar needs or, or, or wishes uh, when it was founded? Who wants to go first? I think I'll go first. Uh, if Mark doesn't mind, I'm sure he doesn't. Um, it's a, it's, it is an interesting, interesting question about what makes environmental history revolutionary in the sense that I think at one time it was, well, like all revolutions, it was, it was once rather, it's lost some of its revolutionary edge in the sense that when, it, what, when environmental history became a self-conscious subfield um, and began to publish under, uh, under uh, uh, journals that were, that were uh, meant to be new, to have a new approach. The methodological innovation, you can call it a revolution, I suppose, but the innovation was to incorporate a different kind of source space that hadn't been used much before, and that would be the scientific source space. Um, and for a while, that was fairly revolutionary in the sense that, that uh, especially some of the founders of the field um, received a lot of uh, pushback from people who thought that looking at wildlife studies or soil sample studies, dendrochronology, um, that wasn't what historians did. And uh, there, so for a long while, that was revolutionary. I think that, that um, 
that that revolution has been surpassed, though I think, by people who have who have taken uh, who have well who have looked a little more closely at science and 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 through a uh, epistemological relativistic lens and and put into question whether science is really uh, the objective uh, measurement of reality that maybe some of the early environmental historians might have thought and some people still do. Um, so in a sense, um, it was it was much more revolutionary um, before and it's sort of the, 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 the revolutionary content of it has, has been, I think, decreased a, a, quite a bit over the last 40, 50 years that it's been publishing and um, it's been, the, the revolution has moved on, so to speak, into different ways of thinking about epistemology and what we can rely upon when trying to make claims about the past. The revolution has moved on. That's uh, interesting. Would you say that it has that it moved uh, to a field like environmental humanities that is even more encompassing in its scope or in its reach or in its ambition? Well, I think that probably, probably. Well, I wouldn't want to say that. Um, I, although maybe maybe Dolly might. But um, uh, in in the, I, I wouldn't want to say that in the sense that. Um, that it needs to be that way, but maybe that it that it is that way. I'm I'm not sure that I'm actually on board with the revolution or the this, these epistemological shifts that I just described. Um, but I think that um, that there's been a movement towards relativism, epistemological relativism, in all branches of of scholarship over the last you know 50, 60 years. Um, that um, I think actually can put environmental historians in rather a difficult place. But um, if you're going to you if if you're going to embrace relativism then it makes environmental humanities probably a bit more um, tenable than environmental history because um, when people, uh, if, it's very difficult to talk about environmental history um, and talk about change over time if we become bogged down in perceptions of, that we're just talking about perceptions of, of reality. And these are deep questions about, about what it is we think we're looking at when we're looking at history, whether we're looking at things that really happened or things that, that people uh, perceived as happening. So I guess it's a long way of saying that it, it, I'm not sure I want it to be, but it probably is more compatible with an umbrella than with a, than a methodologi uh, the methodological heritage of environmental history the way it developed in the 60s and 70s. Well, thank you, Stephen. I, th I think uh, that, that's something uh, that you bring up uh, an aspect that of course is worth a discussion of its own. And I think we'll, we might want to return to it, the what you call epistemological relativism uh, as a, a, a like uh, having uh, in in a way it, it is now um, being apparent in in all humanities fields, uh, as I heard you say, um, and 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 what history or environmental history is in that regard. That is a very interesting question that I make a note of, so that we might return to it later. Mark, uh, your view on the journal and the fields. Um, yeah, I mean, Dolly and Stephen have said a lot already. Um, I would say that the uh, revolutionary departure point for environmental history uh, remains, and I think it actually, um, in many ways, undergirds environmental humanities as well, which, at least from a historian's point of view, is that abstracting people from the other than human world fundamentally distorts that history. That um, people don't inhabit some ethereal world where they live, where ideas and politics aren't influenced by material forces that are beyond their control, right? That uh, to talk about a landscape is to talk about both human and nature um, in if we're to be reductionist about this, right? And you can't understand one without the other. And since people inhabited these real places, um, you know, uh, they had to, uh, they had to, uh, if we if we just if we ignored the the one side of it the ostensibly natural side of it, then we've distorted uh, their the lived experience of people in the past, um, and so I think of um, you know pushing down past you know, Dolly mentioned sort of uh, the various studies disciplines, but if pushing down past the sort of um, lower strata of society, so you went from all the politics to people all the way down to uh, the lowest strata of society, and then Worcester famously saying, we've got to push deeper down to the soil itself. Um, and historians don't, haven't, hadn't done that. And even now, I, I don't know how revolutionary, we're talking about whether or not the, the revolution's a success. I, I, don't, I don't know. We're uh, the fastest growing subfield in at least uh, American history. Um, 
since the 1970s and by a long shot. Um, but I don't know that we fundamentally altered the discourses of most other disciplines. I mean, cultural history has had a much more profound influence on environmental history to come back to Stephen's point mm -hmm. than environmental history has had on cultural history. I think that's probably uh, fair to say. So uh, where, whether environmental humanities is a, is a real departure or not, I'm still sort of making my mind up because I think one of the things that set environmental history apart at the time was how interdisciplinary it was. So in its very first year, it sponsored two sessions at the HSS, right, the History of Science uh, Society's annual meeting. Uh, it brought in geographers. Uh, it was influenced by geographers right, in, pr in pretty profound ways. Um, it methods uh, of, of anthropology, historical archeology, span and then, as Stephen said, the sciences as well. So it was sort of an inherently uh, interdisciplinary field to begin with, um, but um, fundamentally historical in it, how it measured its evidence. Well, well, I think one, one thing to just throw in there, um, Sabina, is that in some ways, the beginnings of them are also similar in that they are about um, environmental activism. You know, so the 1970s environmental history grows up at a moment in which environmental activism is growing. People are concerned about um, pollution. Um, they're, they're concerned about you know, the effects of uh, natural resource extraction. Um, and environmental humanities uh, awakens at another moment in which people are again with climate change, um, and seeing global systems uh, and the effects that those have on our local environments. Uh, so, so it is a response to that environmentalism, you know, the environmentalism that we see you know, in the activists uh, like Greta Thunberg and others. Um, now, that's where environmental humanities is coming from. So there's a, there's a very strong activist strain um, about recognizing you know the anthropocene moment um recognizing the 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 profound and deep changes to the planet caused by humans um as well as then uh as mark mentioned this relationship to the non-human right so a big part of environmental humanities has been about uh looking at things like becoming with uh the non-human uh, living with uh those uh non-humans um, and, and structures of the planet. Um, so I think they both have a really strong tie with environmental activism, whether or not everybody who does them now are activists. Well, thank you, Dolly, uh, uh, to bring that up, um, for bringing this up, that both journals, in a way, responded to environmental concerns in different way, perhaps. Um, now, Mark mentioned the soil itself. I don't think that historians as yet have acquired the tools to study the soil itself in the historical work. This is still something that we need to train. Um, and as Dolly said, with the Anthropocene moment, we need to train it again. Um, and my question is, of course, uh, to you, how, how you feel that, that the history of training to look beyond humans, to include other species, to include nature in the very material ways, to uh, look at interspecies relations, how that history has developed and what kind of opposition or conflict you are meeting um, with uh, the journals that you are, um, that you've been embarking on. So do you see frictions in these approaches uh, and in the communities that we try to address? Or are, uh, are these, do you, do you, do you feel that, 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 that these ambitions uh, can be realized rather smoothly because they always respond to what is a need at a specific historic, uh, historical moment? I guess I, I can just throw out uh, first um, there. And I think what I would say is that uh, what, what we get as submittals 
uh, to environmental humanities is interesting in that people can come from base their work in many different disciplines. But in essence, they submit to us because they somehow feel that their environmental topic is outside of the realm of their specific disciplinary journal. So we get those kind of submittals. And then you get the kind of submittals that are actually um, what we call transdisciplinary. So they're reaching beyond uh, their specific discipline and trying to uh, make arguments that might apply more broadly. That first kind is actually quite difficult um, because, you know, somebody who is a, a literature scholar that wants to place a, a work of, of literature scholarship about the environment is looking for somewhere to put it. Um, I mean, that's what journals are, all right? They, they're, they're venues, they're channels of publication. Um, and to be honest, we, we reject a lot of the submittals to us based on the fact that they are one discipline. And it's not that their methodology is one discipline. That's actually perfectly fine. So if you want to submit us a, a history piece uh, that's based in history, that that's your discipline and you you know, are using the tools of a historian, that's great. But it's about who are you speaking to with that historical piece. And if you're only speaking to historians, are, based on what we see is your argument and the literature in which you're placing it, we say, well, send it to environmental history. That's the right place for it. Um, because you're speaking to environmental historians or historians in general. Um, but if, on the other hand, the piece uses historical method, but you're speaking to people, you're trying to say, here's an, an ongoing conversation in the humanities at a larger level. Um, so something that a, a um, film scholar can use, something that a philosopher can use, they can refer to, they can see a bigger argument, um, even though you're basing it in history, that's the kind of piece we want. So, so there is this tension, I think, between what people want out of publishing a piece, you know, how they identify where an appropriate journal is, and what we as a journal want to do, um, in that what we're looking to do is to create conversations amongst uh, different disciplines, not just publish the different dif disciplines. Do you see what I'm saying? I, I was uh, so yes. I that's was a that's a say. A, a choice that we're making. Absolutely. I was going to say, um, um, uh, you said journals are channels or they're venues, but I guess they're also making research. They, they don't, they are not a conveyor belt, but they also shape and make their, make us basis in, in that sense, um, uh, which I think is, a, has a, also a constitutive role for any new field that is trying to be like to emerge or to address new, like to create new communities. Um, how do you see uh, um, those tensions um, and now perhaps new tensions arising with environmental humanities in a way competing with environmental history as we knew it and that has been so very successful these past decades? Stefan? you have a yeah, um, yeah I, I, I have we moved on to question number three on the list I think is that we just transitioned is that so yeah um, you can I mean feel free to ventilate your your thoughts <laughs> uh, we don't have to cling to a particular to the okay. list in particular if you have other things that you want to bring up. No, no, I, I mean I, I, I don't I'm, I apologize for asking you that way I was um I, I was thought that the question about the 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 frictions between communities was an interesting mm -hmm. one and in some ways the, the, the Environmental History Journal, although I don't see it as in competition with Environmental Humanities Journal, um, um, has uh, something of the opposite problem in the sense that um, uh, very often our submissions, um, we, uh, and maybe I'm speaking uh, too openly here, but um, our, uh, our submissions don't really have at the core of them as their central interest, the, um, what, uh, at least what Mark and I think, what makes environmental history itself, which is, I'm most interested in that relationship between humans and the non-human world. And um, 
a, a, because it, environmental history is, is, is an, is, has been a sort of a big tent for a long time and embraced a lot of different approaches, um, it's difficult to, to draw uh, bright lines between, um, between what it is and what it isn't. And I don't think that, um, you know, I don't think that that's a very valuable t um, enterprise. But at the same time, um, very frequently we, we receive submissions that, that, um, that are about something else, but then happen outside, if you will, or um, are interested in other questions, say, of, of, uh, of, of imperialism or, or um, social inequality of, in which um, animals or plants are, play a secondary role, but in which people don't really, um, uh, the authors aren't really grappling with what it is, the humans interacting with the non-human world and what the interaction, what the relationship is. Um, and so um, the friction that I think that we perceive most often um, is the one where, um, and it's a difficult line to balance because you don't want to make the, the, the line around the field too small, but if people aren't um, engaging that question, then, it, um, then maybe the article belongs someplace else. Um, it's, and it's often difficult to determine exactly what the author really cares about and what the author says that he or she cares about. Um, but nonetheless, um, I think that it is, uh, although it's impossible to prove there, one gets a sense of what people are really, what really animates someone's scholarship. And so um, to some degree, the friction might be the opposite one is of making sure that everything that goes in the journal really is, at least in our perspective, and that's all we have as editors, um, really is concerned with the central question of environmental history and preventing it from becoming uh, a place where other people, other kinds of history are being published, um, maybe taking the space from the kind of questions that make environment, environmental history what it is and what make it what makes it different. I see. Thanks. Um, where does the article belong? So, uh, to be very provocative, one could say uh, the academic landscape is still. I mean, we're still sorting. We're sorting all the time what belongs and what doesn't. And Dolly mentioned that as well. An article might be outside of what we perceive as being the field or a submission might be trans. And, and how do we want to police that? Do we want that at all? Or uh, what, is, what is actually the larger vision? Uh, I find that is also a, a larger, not epistemological, but in, in a way, a political question of how, how we <laughs> what kind of uh, environmental humanities in the very broad sense we actually want uh, and, and how to navigate that. I, I think that that is, well, at least for me, uh, a, 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 a super interesting question. And uh, I can only imagine what it means to be a journal editor having to categorize all the time. Mark, do you have uh, a thought on, on those kind of tensions that arise in the practical daily work as an editor? Um, when getting submissions and having to decide, is this our field or isn't it? Yeah, this is one of the uh, biggest issues Stephen and I face when we sit down to, to discuss an article, uh, because uh, it is hard to demarcate clear lines on a field that has always been A, interdisciplinary, and B, um, open. Like environmental history has not historically put up a whole lot of boundaries to its uh, uh, to entry. To be an environmental historian, you just need to say you are basically. Um, and then people have different, they weigh it in, in different ways. And we occasionally get uh, disgruntled authors who, you know, uh, say, what do you mean this isn't environmental history? Uh, there was a cow in this piece, or whatever it is. Um, and so uh, we try and head that off at the, uh, at, at the, at, at the at outset now, sort of before we send it out. Um, but uh, environmental history is itself, I mean, I, it is one of the fields because it sort of came of age uh, pretty recently. Um, it's been particularly influenced as maybe the rest of the academy this way has too, but by the um, centrifugal forces that seem to be spinning society into smaller and smaller fragments all the time. And so it's not just environmental history as a field anymore. Now it's Dolly's Envirotech, right? Um, and so there are little subcategories um, uh, below that that create uh, friction. And then uh, we even periodically, um, more than periodically actually, get um, submissions that chastise environmental historians. So the frictions are pretty evident, um, I think, in in how it goes. Um, <clears throat> I always admire the brazenness of folks who are willing to, it takes a good bit of courage to tell the field that 
to submit it to the journal of record of the field that your field is pretty worthless. But um, I'm surprised at how many of these we, we get. Um, uh, and, you know, we, won't, we wanna be open to, the, to being wrong, but we also wanna sort of say, we've been around for a while. A lot of people have thought about these things. Um, and it's pretty hard to say something that's really new that environmental historians haven't thought about before, especially because environmental history as a field has been pretty self-critical in many, in many regards um, over the years. So uh, yeah, the, 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 the frictions are there. And uh, the biggest issue we have, I think, is defining what it is without being, you know, uh, unnecessarily uh, ex exclusionary, um, but also saying we get to publish, you know, we get 100 submissions a year and we get to publish 12 of them, you know, and we're not, we want to publish the 12 ones that speak to what environmental history is ostensibly about, you know? Um, and so there are, we have, it's hard to say no to great submissions that belong somewhere else, but you know, we sort of have to do that sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I, I think that's what's very interesting about that, Marcus, how you say environmental history, like so many history disciplines, right? Have It's about splitting. It's about making smaller and smaller disciplines. What's interesting about environmental humanities, of course, is that it's trying to go the other way in some sense. It's trying to put back together things that have been split up, but in a different constellation than they were before, right? So it's supposed to bring together um, the environmental historians and the eco-critics and the environmental philosophers and the environmental anthropology and cultural geography in a new constellation um, so that you're taking little bits of the other disciplines and then saying, well, what do we have that's similar that can speak to each other? Um, but at the same time, we have exactly the same problem, which is that uh, when I and Franklin you know, we review abstracts first um, to decide if we want to take this paper. And then when the full paper is submitted, we review the paper to determine if we're going to, you know, send it over to the, the associate editors. And it is this call about but what counts as environmental humanities. Um, and as I said, for us, the biggest thing is that the piece um, while situated in a discipline, because I, I, I don't want us to lose that. I think um, we have disciplines that we are trained in and that we have the, the right tools and methods for, but that we look for pieces that have portability, you know, that, that you could actually use the results of this or this big concept or idea that the author is trying to argue for in a field other than uh, the authors. Um, so for us, that's kind of a, uh, a principle that we, we try and look at. Again, what does that mean? It, it does tend to mean in our case that um, pieces tend to be a bit more on the theoretical side than they are in history. Um, at the same time, when we took over the editorship, we made a, a strategic decision that we want things that also use an empirical base. So, um, don't just throw out a theory and, and theorize about it. You have to have some kind of evidence uh, to, to back up uh, that theory because you do run the risk, or we've seen it, uh, that, that there's a potential risk to go too far in, into a theory that isn't based on this actual relationship of people to non-people, right? To, to nature. Um, and so we, we wanted to stress that and, and so as we review pieces that's kind of how we make those decisions but we're also very interested in keeping it open keeping the disciplinary basis open um, in our case we're actually working very hard to try and increase the geographical base and the scholarly base of the journal so that it's not just a northern european north american australian uh, field um, because there's actually scholars in other places that are doing really good work and um, that needs to be brought into the conversation. Well, thank you, Dolly. Um, another provocative thought that I had that in a way you now um, refuted is that to create a new field, you need to have a journal. <laughs> so um, a journal is in a way a constitutive part or element or tool to renew 
an academic landscape, like the disciplinary structures, the disciplines, the teachings, the programs uh, for recruiting, and then the journal. Um, and and I was wondering whether how you how you look upon uh, this this claim uh, to 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 bring something new into the world to ventilate new ideas. You need the outlet, and the journals then, in a way, uh, visibly structure what is there or what can be there and what can be published and what can become visible and communicated and also discussed. So there there is still even in the in this combining function that I hear you uh, relating to that environmental humanities have, there's also, there is affirming and it's also policing all the time. Um, and I wonder what that does to the, the, the disciplines and the, and, and, the, and the publication options that people have, right? Uh, now you could say, okay, now we have a, a, a specialization, we have a diversification of academic fields, now we have more journal, outlets that people can address um, to publish their pieces. Um, but from the perspective that we have here as historians, also trying to do environmental humanities, it also creates, we also have tensions as to like career identity. Where do, where do people belong? Where do they feel they can belong? Uh, do they have to be either or? Can they belong to separate fields? Um, and that is not an, 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 I think, practically not not a not a simple question to to answer. Uh, and what are your views on this kind of, yeah, these career structures that you're in a way meddling with as journal editors? I think you're very powerful in this regard, actually, because who, those who cannot publish cannot be seen, and their CVs will be empty. I mean, it's it's very simple in that regard, right? We need to publish. So the journals are powerful actors. How do you see your own power in this regard of career options? Wow, that's a that's that's a really good question um, and a very uh, uh, one we have to think about um, when we make our decisions uh, about uh, uh, publication, of course, um, and what our what our power is to shape the field. Um, I think environmental humanities is in a bit of a, an interesting spot because there aren't many environmental humanities degrees. Um, so being situated at this kind of junction point of a bunch of different fields um, makes us in some ways a bit of an outlier in that if you're getting a, um, if you're a young career scholar in history or in literature, Generally, the people who you're going to be submitting your uh, CV to are not going to think of environmental humanities as a leading place for your field um, because of because of that. Now, it is the leading place, I think, for environmental humanities, although there are some other journals. I mean, uh, Resilience was set up basically at the same uh, time. Um, there's a brand new journal. Uh, Ecosim out of Turkey that's also doing environmental humanities. Um, you know, there are other options, but um, we're, we're in kind of a weird place because people don't get degrees or they don't specialize in environmental humanities very much. It's coming. There are more and more of them. There are more and more, particularly centers like your own in KTH that are environmental humanities as a basic, and, and that's new. Um, so will we have more of that power in the future? Um, because I do think, as, as a historian myself, that when I look at environmental history as a journal, I guess it's a flagship journal. So if you're an environmental historian and you can say, oh, I published in environmental history, it matters. Um, I don't know if environmental humanities quite has that yet. Um, I mean, it, it does in some ways, but, but in others it doesn't because we don't have the same structures within the universities yet as a discipline. But the journal might to be the guys. one way to get that, of course, to acquire that. Um, Stefan and Mark, how do you see yourself as, in a way, guardians of a particular field, or then as obligatory passage points, you might say, uh, for young scholars in particular uh, who need to prove themselves and publish in a particular 
field to get their credits and merited uh, for particular positions uh, that are already out there or will be out there in the future. Yeah, I, I think I can speak for Mark when I say that we, I think we carry that burden around us. We, we think about that all the time. And as a, I think maybe not always, but as a rule, um, people who are, tend, to scholar, tend towards scholarship don't really have a strong affinity for authoritarianism. And yet the words that we've been using during the, through a lot of this conversation have been like policing and gatekeeping <laughs> and guardians and boundaries. And, and uh, it's a little uncomfortable to be in that position, but, uh, but that's, it is what, that is where we are. Um, and uh, and so it's it's an uncomfortable position because uh, and it goes back to maybe the first question about revolution. You, we're always on the lookout for new approaches, for new ways of looking at things, and yet at the same time we want to apply the standards that we've inherited about what what evidentiary proof is, what a good what a good narrative is. There's a strong conservative aspect to to preserving the, the scholarly values of the past at the same time that we're looking around for people who are looking at things in a completely new way. And I sometimes do wonder, and I think maybe all editors do, is this a case where a piece is, is poorly written or poorly conceptualized, or is it so new that I don't understand it? Is, I worry about that all the time. Every time I, I find one that I, I mean, sometimes the rejections are easy, but sometimes you want, uh, you're not cer certain whether this, you're about to reject somebody that's gonna come along and change, revolutionize the field at the next journal where, they, where it's accepted. Um, because the people in environmental history were too caught in, up in the in traditional ways of looking at articles that um, uh, they couldn't see what it was. I worry about it all the time, um, uh, but there's not much I can do about it other than keep it in mind and try to be aware that, that if something were really new and really revolutionary, I wouldn't like it at first, probably. Um, but that said, it, often in its case, I give it. I try to give everything a good chance, and sometimes I, th I just think, well, this doesn't really meet the big three that I like to call them. It doesn't have a narrative, or it doesn't have an intervention, or it doesn't have an argument, and that's uh, we can't leave those things behind. And that's my traditionalism, I guess, um, uh, coming through. It's an it's a paradoxical place we are, where we're where we're both looking for new things and also guardians of what we've inherited, and it's not all that easy to inhabit that spot. Mark, is there something you'd like to add to that perception of yeah, being torn between two ambitions in a way, two aims? Yeah, uh, we're acutely aware that our chief job is to publish the best work that comes across our, the best manuscripts that come across our desks. Um, we, uh, we do try not to, I mean, it, as Stephen said, we have these conversations as, uh, like we are acutely aware of, of, of the weight that, that that's placed on us. Um, but we, we don't really give any weight to seniority. We don't give any weight to um, anything. So we publish our work from grad students and we publish work from young scholars. In fact, I would say most of our work is probably young scholars, uh, just because most of our submissions come from young scholars. You know, you pick sort of pick a big figure in the field, you know, but you know, Bill Cronin, Don Worcester, John McNeil, uh, Harry Ripa, like they don't need more articles at this point in their careers. And so they're less likely to submit them. Um, people who are still sort of establishing the reputation and, and, and climbing uh, are uh, sort of the, the ones who are most likely to, uh, to, to submit to us. But um, we do also take very seriously um, our, even though our first obligation to publish the best stuff that comes across our, the best manuscripts that we receive, uh, we take seriously our obligation to provide uh, serious feedback for serious work right and so uh, we're very deliberate with uh with with desk rejects we're careful with those um and we try and really pick the best referees we can so people get real feedback on their on their work and we give it beyond that we've actually started a new program for graduate students um where if it would ordinarily be a desk reject and it's a graduate student then um this is all transparent we tell the graduate student you have a choice if you want to resubmit it elsewhere you can Right. Uh, if you want, you know, we can withdraw it and resubmit it elsewhere. Uh, or if you want, we'll send it to a single referee. And then we tell the referee that, look, this would ordinarily, or ordinarily been, have desk, uh, been a desk reject, but we would like you to provide feedback for this young scholar, uh, especially in a field like environmental history, where we get people who come into it who have never been trained, who say, uh, haven't read the, the, the literature that would inform their piece properly. 
Uh, and so we put them in touch with someone, sort of a, a mentor, and the mentor can either re reveal themselves or not. It's all handled through our system, so it's, it's anonymous unless people choose it not to be. Um, and so we're, we are really aware of that. Um, we're also really aware because we're, uh, as the sort of flagship journal for the field around the world, we want our submissions to speak to everybody. Um, and so um, Dolly was saying a few minutes ago about how he wanted to speak to uh, across the disciplines. Um, we, we're really thinking about pieces that speak to, you know, um, uh, a historian of, um, you know, an urban historian in Beijing, a forest historian in Vancouver, an agricultural historian in Quito, you know, like, can, would this, would everybody learn something from this? Or is this um, a study of a, of a local community in California that doesn't really have much meaning beyond maybe historians of the American West or something? Um, and we're also aware that there are a growing number of, of other publications that we're trying to encourage. Um, not all great uh, publications are in the English language. Uh, so we've been uh, encouraging, um, working with uh, Halleck a little bit, which is SULTRA, the Latin American journal, uh, with, uh, Globe, uh, with uh, Ecological History, which is the Chinese language one. And then even with um, uh, journals like Global Environment, International Review of Environmental History, uh, so we, when their new issues come out, we tweet about them, for instance. Um, and, um, you know, we encourage people. Sometimes the, the right place for, the, for a piece is one of these other journals. Um, rather than us. Um, but yeah, the rankings are a big deal uh, uh, for tenure committees and all that, and a, probably a bigger deal in Europe than in, uh, than in the United States. Though even, you know, so here at Mississippi State, you need to have um, at least, you know, for historians, the, the monograph is the big thing. So you need that, but you need at least three articles, and at least um, one of those has to be in the flagship journal of your field. So you know, um, we're, we're aware that we're opening and closing doors. Um, and I think the publishing landscape with open access, as Dolly pointed out, is changing too. Um, historians generally aren't, uh, in the United States at least, uh, used to, accustomed to paying anything for publishing. They don't generally have grant money in the United States. Uh, and, uh, but uh, we're published by Oxford and they're catapulting this direction and, um, it's created some issues and, you know, uh, some of the solutions are things like you should publish more articles. Um, and that's not an ideal model in some ways for uh, the humanities, sort of generally. Anyway, that's a roundabout answer, circuitous one. Well, thanks. Thanks for this. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I understand that uh, there's also a lot of responsibility in making a journal uh, in terms of the reviewing, the teaching, the training, but also taking care of geographic scope, language, as you said. Um, and uh, in a way, it, yeah, it gives journals a lot of power in the field to make people visible and make their, their, their work visible. Um, there's a lot of things we could discuss. I was thinking of the journal itself as the medium and how, what that will be in the future. Now we mentioned open access. Um, we could think beyond text. I mean, the journal is still very much text-based. We could think about that a bit, um, but perhaps I'm not sure that we will get to that today because I would like to also look at the questions that the audience has been bringing in before we uh, perhaps do a final round. And here I would ask Yuan to um, summarize or like bring individual questions to the table. Sure. Um, a summary will probably not be possible, but we'll fire off some of them. Um, one of the questions ties back to some of the things both at least Dahl and Mark raised about the difficulty of the editor evaluating or enabling even uh, some of the uh, revolutionary aspects or the multidisciplinarity, if nothing else. Um, but how do you see the role of the peer reviewers themselves? That is, what role can they take on in this mechanism of evaluating this? Is this only the responsibility of, of US editors, so to speak? Or do you see a clear difference here? Um, who's the conservative force, so to speak, and who's, who wants to be more um, moving forward to the new thing? And then uh, is there a possibility to experiment with peer reviewing or more uh, directly, do you plan to experiment? 
Well, for us, I mean, this is, this is an interesting question um, in that many of the pieces that we get, as I said, we're trying to speak to uh, more than one discipline. Um, so it can be challenging sometimes to actually find appropriate reviewers. Uh, we do have at least two reviewers um, that review every piece. Um, we try to pick people who have different backgrounds then uh, to do that. Um, so it may be that they're in that type of field. So let's say it's a study that uses a, a film. Uh, so you might want somebody who's a film studies person um, who does environmental things, but maybe that's a, a Chinese film. So then we want a scholar who uh, knows something about uh, Chinese issues um, and the environment. So you might get that combination. So we try, we try to manage that interdisciplinarity with combinations uh, of reviewers. Um, we are not planning on doing anything innovative or, or different uh, with those review processes that we have uh, right now. Um, it is worth, I, I guess, noting, like in our case, and, and there was a question, I answered it uh, here that's related, which is like, well, what kind of submissions you can take? Um, and you kind of hinted at that, uh, Sabina. You know, as much as we are an online um, journal, so it's open access and it's online, uh, and anybody can read it, thanks uh, to the donations of places like KTH who, who fund us. Um, yeah. Uh, so, but at the same time, we actually have a print version. Uh, so it, it's print on demand. Uh, it has actually produced, so you can see the covers of a couple issues here. Um, and that does mean that the articles need to look like articles. I mean, you know, in that traditional sense, uh, we could potentially have some online only uh, supplements uh, that, that would exist. But as far as like really radically different formats, like a storyboard format or, or um, a video as actually the article, which is entirely possible, is not anything that we're planning on doing right now. Thanks. The, uh, Mark and Stefan, do you have an answer to that question about the peer reviewing? Um, sure. Uh, peer review is uh, um, surprisingly tricky, actually, um, because we do want people who are, you know, experts in the particular, uh, in, in multiple areas, even for environmental history, right? So it's not just transdisciplinary stuff. It's, you know, a, a uh, a piece on, you know, on Israel. We want someone who's an expert in Israel's history as well uh, as someone who knows uh, environmental stuff. So as, as a global journal, uh, it, it's problematic that way or difficult that way. Um, we, um, in terms of uh, experimenting with, with peer review um, at Oxford University Journal Days, uh, we went to a session where we talked a little bit about this. And uh, I think a growing number of journals are moving to um, rather than double-blinded um, open review. Um, and I'm not, we haven't, we haven't seriously considered this, um, but it, it, it's, it's an interesting idea. We just got a, a, a manuscript review back yesterday, actually, that was um, really critical. But uh, the referee um, included um, his contact information at the bottom for the author. And I think that's actually really useful. Um, so if you're peer reviewing, <laughs> Um, uh, this is the sort of thing where um, being being frank about it and uh, and revealing yourself might actually open new connections uh, and and uh, be more useful. I, I don't know whether that's going to affect the academy or not. Um, again, uh, one of the reasons we stopped we started this uh, graduate student uh, program with, was that we because we get submissions from all over the world. We don't want to. Um, it sounds terrible. We don't want to waste peer review. Um, you know, because people are volunteers. We don't want to waste good reviewers on pieces that we know aren't going to make it. But we also take seriously our, our obligation to, uh, you know, provide feedback to people. And so this was a way to do it. If you give it to one person, we can save people for down the road. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know how we would experiment in, in, in peer review beyond that. Um, but we're open to ideas, Marco. I have my email. Yeah, it's it is a provocative question in the sense that we you know when someone can point out something that you've never that you have taken for granted, it makes you think. Um, 
I think that probably uh, if if I never got the sense that that uh, evaluating peer review was part of part of my job. I think I was hired for a job by by the executive committee of uh, of the society. I, I think that if I we, that Mark and I wanted to introduce a new system for evaluating manuscripts, we'd have to ask for some permission first. I don't think we could just do that. Um, we're leaving aside the, uh, the question of you know what that might be. Um, there's a uh, we're coming back to the same point. There's a lot of inertia, a lot of institutional inertia about how things are done, and and uh, the, probably the most influence we have is is the choice of peer reviewers. But but uh, about the concept itself, I uh, I don't I don't think we have that one. And we're also uh, sort of um, obligated to the peer reviewers to some degree. Like we could, in theory, I suppose, accept an article without sending it out for peer review. Um, we can because we can reject articles without sending up for peer review. Uh, um, I suppose in theory, but once we send it out for peer review, we're obligated to uh, to respect the peer reviewers to some degree, um, you know. And so that um, that does make it even more traditional uh, for us in the in the sense that um, even if we think something's really good. We can, we might give it a, a, a revise and resubmit or something, but we can't, we can't say, yeah, this is, this is going to be in. We, we want this when the reviewers say, nope. You know. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's an important point is that you do take the reviewers seriously, but as editors, you can overrule it uh, in either direction. Uh, so sometimes, you know, you get your two reviewers and one of them says, oh, you should print this as it is. And the other reviewer is like, oh, here's all the serious flaws. Right. So the piece is somewhere in between uh, generally, but you have to make your own decision. Uh, I know that I've already had uh, occasion where a reviewer said, oh, this doesn't belong in environmental humanities. It's a perfectly fine article, but it's not environmental humanities. And I overruled that. I said, well, then your definition of environmental humanities is not mine. Um, you know, so so then I like you know, you, you take the contents of their of their review, but their final judgment was not in agreement with mine. Um, so, so you do as editor, you know, have that option, but you have to take them seriously. Because most of the time, they're specialists in something that you actually don't know. So, so we do depend upon our reviewers to provide that kind of feedback to us um, and to our, uh, to the authors. Um, because they know better than we um, on many things. Well, thanks. Um, you all, perhaps we have uh, um, time for another question um, before we round this off. And um, yeah, we've talked a lot about the peer reviewers. Perhaps we can look at, okay, how creative then can an article submission be to appear in print. Now Dolly said it must look like an article because we're still dealing with the print medium, even though it's online, but it's still text-based. So how, how much can you deviate from that? And what would be um, sort of the, a, 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 good, a good contribution um, that also goes beyond the, the textual? Um, you mentioned film, you mentioned, or it could be images. So how, how much can you go out of your way in, to, to, to still fit and also do something new that no one else had done before? <laughs> Is that possible or would that, uh, would that not pass the, the, your, your review or the reviewer's review? Yeah, I just made a joke with uh, with Mark the other day. I was I was th saying I w we should publish a piece in iambic pentameter sometime, or you know we should. Uh, the uh, Homer didn't write with footnotes. Why? Then that's the way the history was was conveyed for for <laughs> generations. Why do we have to do it in this particular format? And um, I don't think he laughed when I made the joke. <laughs> he didn't like it very much. Um, we're getting back to this idea of, of traditionalism. I think that if the environmental history might get, we we feel like we have a, a reputation to uphold. And I would really like to have the field look a little bit more open than it does when you, I mean, we do have some parts of the journal and uh, I, I think Dolly does too, where we have 
uh, a color insert and we have images and you know there are uh, we sometimes make uh, point people to the website for additional content but that aside it looks not too different from the way it did 30 years ago or, or 60 years ago where there's uh, there's a colon in every title and the, it's in it's in bold face at the top of the titles on the bold face of the top and you, you, I don't need to describe it you know all this and uh, I think that if we I, I personally would like moving away from that, I think, and uh, trying to be more engaging because um, it's, it's going to be a problem that, that uh, academic history is, is, uh, is becoming marginalized in, in the culture and people don't pay much attention. People still love history. If you look at something like Hamilton or at the, the New York Times bestsellers, they love history, but they're, the histories that people consume are not written by us. And I think that's a shame. Um, and, that, uh, and I'd like to do more to, to break out of that box. And yet I also sense that if we started you know, publishing a graphic novel kind of article about, I just don't think it would go very well. Um, uh, and I, I don't even know where to have that conversation, uh, you know, with, with hiring committees. What would, what would you, would your estimation of our journal decrease if one of our journals, one of our articles each issue was, you know, had, had speech bubbles like a comic book. Uh, I, I've got a feeling it wouldn't go well. This is a problem. Um, in the sense that we expect certain things from our, our fellow scholars um, and those expectations may not be serving us all that well as a discipline or as a as a actor in society. We may be marginalizing ourselves and making ourselves irrelevant um, through those very preferences. Uh, I'm, as you can tell, I'm divided on the matter. Well, and I think this is and this is something that that, um, you know, we have to keep in mind, right? What what counts? as scholarship and what forms. So in our journal, then what we have is some different article types that people can submit. So there's the research article, the standard um, 9,000 word uh, article, but then uh, we have some other types, including a provocation, which is the same length, but is uh, proposing something that uh, pushes, pushes some buttons that might be uncomfortable. So we actually have that as a type. Um, we have another type called a commentary, which is a, a short type. Um, so this is something that, say, someone wanted to write a, a short article that is specific to um, statues being removed and what this says in environmental humanities or whatever. So it could be a short, short piece, um, a commentary. And then we've just added uh, a new type um, with three to 5,000 words um, on environmental humanities and practice, which is specifically to reach to this kind of, you know, uh, artist practice, um, community practice, um, things that we find because of this activism uh, part of environmental humanities, many people are active and doing things in the communities and would like a peer reviewed format to actually publish what their findings are and to be able to share those with other people. So we're, we're just now launching that um, as a form. So again, it's about making a different kind of uh, word limits, different kind of reviewers. So we've talked about that, that when we get those pieces, you know, a reviewer doesn't have to have a PhD to review a piece. Uh, for us, they need to be qualified. So you know, it, it may be that you need to send it to someone who's an environmental artist, for example, in a, a given environmental humanities and practice piece. So we are doing some experimentation and we just added that. We're, we're doing this experimentation um, with some of the, the types, but yet they still all look like articles, right? <laughs> we do include a lot of images though, luckily, because we're online, we don't have the same, it's purely a page restriction for us. Uh, so images add pages uh, to your article, um, but but we don't have to like, oh, we can only have five of them in, a journal, in an issue or something. Well, thanks. I, yeah, of course, I was thinking of art, performative research that is not text based only, but goes beyond, as we've seen in the previous section here, the session on um, with the film, the, the video, um, yeah, what do you call that, a video research piece um that we cannot simply print uh, we can put it online but it's not it doesn't look like an article um and thinking that environmental humanities includes or claims or wants to include this kind of research as well as research we also need to think about how to give that proper expression i think 
uh, and that will perhaps be for the future to think more about. We have one more question we want to um, pick up before we close, and that is a, a question about the, the, uh, the pandemic we're in. How do you think the journals will change during the pandemic? Do we need to become more radical, even more radical than we already are? Any thoughts? Yeah, I have um, some. I'll go, go ahead, ahead please. Well, I, mean, I think it would be the same thing that we say because we've talked about this. The, um, the uh, things are, are we, I mean, it could be, and it probably won't be the case that things are going to change in a month or two with a, an introduction of a vaccine. That might change everything. But um, failing that, then things are going to change for historians because we're not going to be able to, uh, I can't do my research in Russia right now, and I don't know when that's going to change. Um, people, uh, and even people in the United States find that the archives and libraries are closed. Um, uh, either the way that we do history is going to have to grind to a halt or we're going to have to find different ways, different kinds of evidence that we accept. And I'm not sure which one of those is going to happen, to be totally honest. But um, I feel very bad for, the, for the, dis the graduate students in our department who are dissertating right now and planned to spend this 12-month this period in a library in, uh, in archives in Philadelphia, and they're just closed. Um, and does that, I don't know what, uh, no one knows what to do about that. Are we going to change what our standards of evidence are because the libraries and, and archives are closed? The first answer is, I think, the first, my first answer is no. On the other hand, are we, we just can't, we're not going to let history, uh, things just, I, I guess for a short while we might be able to, to look the other way if people, uh, when, they, when they turn their dissertations in, they say that um, I was planning on looking at all these things, but instead I had to do oral interviews because they were closed and we might let that go for a year or two, but, um, uh, but depending on how long, some people are saying this, that COVID is going to change society permanently. We don't know. And if it does change society permanently, that is to change how much we move and what's open, and then we may have to change the, what sort of standards we have for scholarship and evidence. And uh, it's one of those many uh, things that we just don't know right now. But we have to, uh, I've been thinking about it. I'm sure everyone uh, in, in a similar position has been. Well, thanks for that. I, I, I guess we can, uh, uh, we, we could say that COVID might change also academia permanently, and that concerns travel habits, but also perhaps then research itself and the way we, we publish it um, and what kind of material we, we can access. Uh, that's something to think about. A uh, uh, very interesting question uh, that, of course, goes like way beyond what we can, what we, we can cover here, but interesting to think about. Um, you want that one more question? Yeah, that there was a, to actually raise. an earlier question that was brought up about whether or not you see environment humanities or environmental history also coming to or coming back to geography, because I think within geography, some could argue that we have grown out from them. Uh, but I think this ties back to a comment you made earlier, Mark, about the centrifugal force that is somehow spinning society into small, small circles, including our journals. Um, do you see uh, a point in time where the names of these journals would be just history and, and humanities? <laughs> that has become so apparent that environment is like part of the field uh, to counteract the centrifugal force, so to speak. Is that even possible or desirable? Um, yeah, it comes back to a point I made earlier, I think, that uh, historians, the environmental history has uh, not had a huge, as huge an impact on the broader field of history, at least not as big a one as I think. I think most historians still proceed as if people are gods, or at least godlike, um, and aren't encumbered by material realities, um, um, however constructed they may be. Um, and I think uh, part of that is the traditional stuff that Stevens come back to, like we just are creatures of habit and these are the methods that historians use and, you know, anything outside that. Um, you know, uh, and, and part of that I think is uh, the difficulty of, uh, and I think Sabina mentioned this, the difficulty of sort of uh, mastering the, the various disciplines you need to, um, or at least getting a handle on them, not mastering them, but getting a handle on, you know, soil science. Right, this is not a conventional thing to wrap your head around, but it can matter a great deal in terms of explaining a particular event or 
um, even something as big as, say, slavery, right, in the United States. It can certainly factor into explanations of that anyway. Um, so, yeah, I would sort of like to see that. I would like to see environmental stuff, uh, environmental aspects emphasized to a greater degree in uh, conventional journals. And so it's just reflexive, like race, class, gender is sort of just reflexive now. Um, but I think we're a long way, a long way from that. Um, geography is an interesting case because at least on this side of the Atlantic, um, it sort of collapsed as a discipline. That's not, not mean not as an intellectual endeavor, but in terms of institutional support about the same time that environmental history uh, took off. Um, and so um, environmental history sort of absor absorbed a lot of these people. And it's actually hard to draw a distinction between the two in, in many cases. You know, the former president of the, the, pre, the pre, right now Ed Russell is, uh, I think it was um, Graham Wynn, who's a geographer before that, right? I mean, president of the American Society for Environmental History. So um, might be a distinction without a difference in, in many cases in the last 30 years. Any final thoughts on uh, these last two questions? Dolly, uh, a remark? Otherwise? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things if we say, okay, well, it should it ever just be uh, humanities, um, you know, incorporating the environment. I mean, I, yes, as Mark said, I, I think that environment is always, should always be in anyone's analysis. And if they haven't accounted for it, they're missing something. Um, and it's like just missing an entire, you know, actor group, um, you know, within their, within their story, whatever their story is. At the same time, I think there'll always be a place for environmental history and environmental humanities because it's about what your focus is. So while I can advocate that all historians and all literature people and all philosophers should somehow account for the relationship between humans and nature, that doesn't mean that that's the focus of their study. That's the difference in environmental humanities and environmental history. That is the focus of the study. And, and Stephen made that point earlier that it's, we don't want pieces where that's just tangential and it so happens that there's a, you know, cow in the story, but it's that somehow that's fundamental to the story itself. And there will always be then, this is always a necessary avenue for that scholarship, which makes it the point of telling the story. Well, thank you. Thank you all three for uh, great uh, inputs and food for thought. I'm now thinking, why is the cow naturally environmental? <laughs> Perhaps for the cow, the human is the environment. Um, so I wouldn't even count a cow necessarily as like sufficient to qualify for an environmental history or environmental humanities piece, that would have to be further explained. It's like, okay, this is gender studies uh, because here is a woman in it, or it's gender studies. It's not gender studies because there's only men. So I think we, <laughs> but I see the point, of course, uh, that that you you uh, uh, are making. Um, and uh, yeah, I, again, I'd like to thank uh, the three of you and also Johan here for um, a great discussion that I hope also um, has um, been giving to the audience outside uh, that is listening in and has been contributing with questions to this, yeah, I guess, uh, question that will, will continue to be with us uh, when we talk about remaking of academic fields. Um, because, yeah, I guess we'll meet in a year from now uh, for streams and uh, see uh, what, uh, how the field has developed already then uh, further developed um, so to see where these journals, how these journals will uh, continue and what kind of new themes will come up to think through. So thank you everyone for a great day today. Um, the recordings are already on the website, I just learned. Um, I want to wish everyone a good evening 
And I hope that you will be back with us tomorrow again, everyone who is still out there listening. We have a final full afternoon tomorrow with interesting conversations and trailers on environmental humanities as the field is defined or self-defined now. And we will look particularly at environmental justice issues, at the environmental history of migration and on sustainable academia. So please have a look at the schedule on the web and please join us again tomorrow at 12.30 Stockholm time, right? And uh, for now, again, thanks so much and good afternoon and evening, everyone. <laughs>